For those of you who are, are new with us this morning, uh, let me kind of fill you in on what we're doing. This is the time in our, our service together when we read God's Word and we teach from God's Word. And, and this year, we're doing something a little bit different than we normally do in the sense that we like to take a book of the Bible and work through it verse by verse and idea by idea, trying to understand what God was saying and what difference it makes and apply, how it applies to our life now. And, and this year, we're doing something a, a shade different. And then instead of looking at one particular book of the Bible and, and trying to understand the thrust of that story and how it applies, we're looking at an overview of the entire Bible and how the entire Bible tells one story of God's brilliant work of redemption and God's great drama of redemption. We're going to run our hands over the contours of the entire Bible, hoping to see the thrust of that story and how God has woven that through the entire work of the Bible. So that's what we're doing. This morning, we're in the midst of that series. And so instead of taking six months or three months to work through a particular book, uh, this morning, we're going to take one morning to work through an entire book of the Bible. And hopefully, as we've said in the past, it's really to help you see this story to see God's redemptive work in the life of its people, but hopefully also whet your appetite to to get into God's word, to read it, to understand it for yourself. And this morning, by God's uh, really uh, interesting providence, uh, we come to the book of Judges in our study. Um, The people of Israel, as we saw in in Joshua last week, uh, have been led into the land that God had promised to his ancestors, their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were going to go into this land, but they weren't going to be able to go into this land with their leader, Moses. They weren't going to go into this land with their parents. Because of their parents' disobedience and Moses' disobedience, they weren't going to be able to get to the promised land. But this generation was. And we saw in the book of Joshua how a new generation with a new leader uh, began to move into the new land that God had promised. And though everything on the surface seemed to be changing and always in transition and flux, we looked at how uh, underneath the surface God's word to his people never changed. God's power for his people never changed. God's personal presence with his people remained the same when everything else on the service looked like it was changing and shifting. And this morning, we now come to the book of Judges where it's gonna chronicle the next 200 years in the life of Israel now that they're in the land. And they're not wandering in the wilderness anymore. They're not nomads. They're not following clouds. They're not following pillars of fire. They're actually in the land that God has promised to give them. They're in the land of milk and honey. No more manna from heaven, no more water out of rocks. They're in a fruitful place. How are they going to do? How are they going to do? Um, That's what the book of Judges is really all about. Um, And I have to admit this this morning. I was telling the first service this, and I think I need to tell you as well. Um, The book of Judges is one of the most honest and frankly disturbing books in the entire Bible. Um, When people tell me, And you'd be surprised how often I hear it, um, that the Bible is boring. Uh, That is a surefire way to know you've never actually read it. Uh, Because the Bible is anything but boring. Uh, And this is why we talk around here a lot about reading the Bible like a human. Uh, Read it like a human. When you come to the book of Judges, you'll find that God's word, in particular, the story of God's people here in this time in their life and in their journey, is anything but boring. With nearly every single page as you turn the book of Judges, you're going to find yourself going, did he really just do that? No. There's no way they just did that. When you think it couldn't get any more scandals or worse, you turn the page again like, no. There's no way they just did that. But it's the truth. That's the story in the book of Judges. Um, And I'm not sure what it actually says about me, uh, but, you know, I've got the flu. I'll be confessional. Um, the book of Judges is one of, most, one of my most favorite books in the Bible. It's one of the most disturbing and honest books of the Bible, but it's one of my most favorite books in the Bible. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about it before we kind of open it up and, and jump into it. Um, we tend to group the book of Judges with a number of other books in the Bible and call them the historical books of the Bible. Um, we tend to look at them like history, telling the history of the people of Israel in a particular time. Uh, but the Jewish people and the way they order the books of the Bible, they don't consider the book of Judges a book of history. They actually consider the book of Judges as a former prophet. It's a prophetic book to them. And to understand the book as a, as a prophetic book means you understand the book as, as generally not just conveying history and information, but conveying a message. It's a sermon in a sense. And the book of Judges is very sermonic. Um, it's structured very much like a sermon. Some historians and commentators think it's a collection of sermons or, or one extended sermon to the people of, of Israel. Um, It's a fascinating book, and it's important to understand that as you read it. 
to try to catch the thrust of it. And here's the overall message of the book of Judges. If I could just distill it down the best that I can, it's this. It's two parts. Um, God's people will always make a mess of their lives when they take God for granted. God's people will always make a mess of their lives when they take God for granted. Second part, but God relentlessly offers his grace to people who don't deserve it, don't seek it, don't even appreciate it, even after they've been saved by it. God's people will always make a mess of their lives when they take God for granted. But God relentlessly offers his grace to people who don't deserve it, seek it, or appreciate it, even after they've been saved by it. This is the book of Judges. And this morning, it's gonna be one of these sermons, if you've been around for a little while, where we'll read a little bit, and I'm just gonna talk about it a little bit. We'll read a little bit, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, And so if you've got your Bibles, open them up to the book of Judges. And we're gonna spend the bulk of our time in the first two chapters of Judges because it's these first two chapters that actually give us, in a sense, the setting, the context, and really the entire outline for the rest of the book of Judges. Remember, it's a sermon. This guy's a lot better than me. He's actually gonna tell you what he's going to do, why he's going to do it, and how he's gonna do it before he actually begins to unpack it. So it's a much better preaching method than mine. But he he kind of outlines everything here in the beginning, and we'll use the first couple of chapters to kind of jump into the rest of the book to see what he's talking about. So if you've got your Bibles open, Judges chapter one. We'll start in verse one. (coughs) Excuse me. It says, after the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, and said, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me into the territory allotted to me, that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him, and then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. So for the next 14 verses after this, you see Judah and Simeon absolutely tearing it up through the land, conquering people after people, driving out people after people. And then we come to verse 19. And verse 19 says this, the Lord was with Judah and he took possession of the hill country. And you get this dreadful word, but, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Judah did well, but he didn't quite do it exactly as God had said. But what about the rest of Israel? What about the other tribes? Judah's just one tribe. Simeon's just one tribe. What about the rest of Israel? Well, we get that in chapter 1 too. Look at verse 21. But the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived there with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Down to verse 27. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Ibliam and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megadito and its villages. That's pretty bad. For the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. When Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out completely. And Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer, so the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalol, so the Canaanites lived among them, but became the subject of forced labor. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon or of Ahalab or Akzib or Helba or Afik or Rehob. So the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anath. So they lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became subject to forced labor for them. Verse 34, this is an interesting one. The Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country. The Amorites pressed the tribe of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. And the Amorites persisted in dwelling in Mount Herez, but the hand of the house of Joseph rested heavily on them. Eventually, they became subject to forced labor. God told his people to drive out the nations who were living in the land that he was giving them. He had promised them already, we looked at it in the book of Joshua, to not only always be with him, but to go before them, to be strong and to be courageous, to drive out the nations in the land, but 
As you see in chapter one, they failed. But their reasoning for their failure seems pretty plausible, doesn't it? They had better military equipment. They had iron chariots. When we took down Jericho, we had horns and we had preachers. They had iron chariots. You find in some of the stories that the people just persisted and wouldn't leave. Well, they just didn't want to go. We tried, but they just didn't want to leave their land. They fought back. We came in to kick them out, but they actually fought us back. They actually had more resolve than we did. You saw one driving the people of Israel back out of the land. Well, we'll make the best of it. Though we won't drive them out of the land, we'll put them to forced labor. That's the most economically efficient way to deal with it, right? We won't drive them out. We'll just make them work for us. Now we can get them to do for us everything we don't want to do for ourselves. It seems reasonable, doesn't it? Their assessment of their behavior seemed perfectly plausible and perfectly reasonable. In chapter 2, though, you get God's assessment of it. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. And here's the key. Look at this. But you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you've done? The Israelites looked at God and they said, the Canaanites had better weapons. God, we couldn't drive them out. They had more resolve than we did. You know what we figured in the long run? We'd be better off getting them to serve us than driving them out of the land completely. We could actually get the production and the agriculture going faster if we kept them in the land and made them do forced labor. Completely plausible, right? This was their understanding of their excuses, but God had a completely different answer for them. He said very plain and very simply, you've disobeyed me. They tried to say we couldn't do it. Here are all the reasons we couldn't do it. And God said, no, you simply wouldn't do it. Not you couldn't do it. You wouldn't do it. So here's where we have to talk for a second. Have you ever, or let's even make it even better. Have you recently asked yourself if there is anything in your life which you say, I can't do? But if God were to give his assessment, he would say you wouldn't do. Let's make it more specific. Is there anyone in your life which you say, I can't forgive? But if God were to give his assessment, he'd say you just won't forgive. Regardless of the depth and the degree to which God has forgiven you. Is there any relationship or situation or person in your life which you say, I I simply just can't tell them the truth? But if God were to give his assessment, he'd say, no, you just won't tell them the truth. I can't, God. Speaking the truth to them in love as you have called me to do would just cause too much damage. It's too hard for me. I I can't do it. Would his assessment be no? You just won't do it. Is there anything in your life where you say, I just simply can't resist doing this? I just can't stop doing this. I just can't not do this. But if God were to give his assessment, he'd just simply say, no, you, you just won't resist this. Have you asked yourself or even looked at your own heart recently to see if there's anything you say you can't do, to which God would say, no, you simply won't do. You see, our excuses, our rationalizations, let's put it that way, just like the Israelites, our rationalizations seem completely reasonable. They seem completely plausible. But in chapter two, verse one, God takes us behind the excuses, behind the reasons behind ultimately the disobedience and he uncovers for us the source of that disobedience which is a very very deadly forgetfulness look at what God said in the first couple of verses he said I brought you out of Egypt and led you to the land that I promised have you forgotten what I've done 
Have you forgotten how I have rescued you? I said I will never break my covenant with you. Have you forgotten who I am? Have you forgotten my faithfulness? Have you forgotten that I am the one who promised myself to you to always be with you and for you and for you to be my people? You see, God is exposing for us that like Israel, behind our disobedience is usually a failure to remember who God is and what he's done. And we'll see more clearly in just a couple minutes when we get further in chapter two that it's not a failure to remember details. It's not a failure to remember information. It's not as though they forgot the Red Sea. It's not as though they forgot the dry land crossing the Jordan. It's not as though they forgot who God was and what he's done. It's just those things no longer seem precious to them. And they no longer valued those things appropriately. Half, half-hearted worship, half-hearted obedience has never, ever, ever gone well for God's people. And look at God's response to this in, in verse three. So now I say, this is God speaking, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and they wept. But what God said should be no surprise. In Joshua's farewell speech to Israel, listen to what Joshua said. You've probably already read this in your reading for the week. Joshua said, be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. This is in chapter 23, verse 11. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain, and this is what Joshua told them before they ever crossed the, into the land, know for certain the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. This is what God had already said to them. And so now, like any good preacher or any good storyteller, any good writer, the writer of the book of Judges has built up a tension that has to be resolved, that has to be answered. God cannot tolerate or live with evil. This is what we've seen throughout our entire study so far of the Bible. God can't tolerate and he cannot live with evil. But he also cannot tolerate cutting off or the loss of the people he's committed himself to. And so what's going to happen? Is God going to give up on his people in their disobedience? And if he does, was he ever really faithful in the first place? Or is God going to give in to his people and give in to their sin? And if so, was he ever really as holy as we thought? Ever really as holy as he said? How is God going to resolve this tension? Now, ultimately, this is the story of the entire Bible, but this is what we're going to see in the book of Judges. And so from here, in the rest of chapter 2, the writer is going to outline what the rest of the book looks like and how this tension is going to play itself out. Let's look at this and see what it has to say. We'll start in verse 6. You're going to get a bit of an aside that's going to kind of give you some context here. Verse 6 says, Joshua sent the people away, and the Israelites went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. So he's taking you back for just a moment to the time right before Joshua died. The people worshiped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime, and during the lifetimes of the elders who outlived Joshua, they had seen all the Lord's great works that he had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gahash. That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. So Joshua and his entire generation that we saw last week had remained faithful to the word of God, trusting in the power and the presence of God to do what God had called them to do, has now died. And look at what the next thing it said. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works that he had done for Israel. The Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They worshiped the Baals and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods from surrounding peoples and bowed down to them. They infuriated the Lord for they abandoned him and they worshiped Baal and the Ashereths. And so now they're gonna fall into false worship. This new generation in the land, in the land of comfort, in the promised land, they've gotten comfortable with where they are and we're gonna see them sliding into false worship. This is the first part of this cycle that we're gonna see. Go verse 14. The Lord's anger burned against them. He handed them over to marauders. He raided them. He sold them to the enemies around them, and they could no longer resist their enemies. 
Whenever the Israelites went out, the Lord was against them and brought disaster on them, just as he had promised and sworn to them, so they suffered greatly. So for their sin, God disciplined them. God allowed the surrounding nations who desired to take over Israel, he used that desire against Israel. But he was disciplining them. Look at verse 16. So the Lord raised up judges who saved them from the power of the marauders, but they did not listen to their judges. Instead, they prostituted themselves with other gods, bowing down to them. They quickly turned from the way of their fathers who had walked in obedience to the Lord's commands. They did not do as their fathers did. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for the Israelites, the Lord was with him and saved the people from the power of their enemies while the judge was still alive. The Lord was moved to pity whenever they groaned because of those who were oppressing and afflicting them. Whenever the judge died, the Israelites would act even more corruptly than their fathers, going after other gods to worship and bow down to them. So they did not turn from their evil practices or their obstinate ways. So here's a picture of the cycle of the life of sin, repentance, disobedience, and restoration that you're going to see in this entire book. Israel's going to slide into sin, into false worship, into greater and greater degrees and levels of false worship. God's going to discipline them by using the surrounding nations to oppress them. He's going to use a number of the nations, and we'll see that in just a minute. And under oppression, in a period of time, they're finally going to cry out to God in repentance. And God is going to raise up a deliverer who's going to deliver them. But it's only going to last for a little while. And as soon as that deliverer is done, as soon as the people are free, you see them again turning away from the Lord, sliding back into sin. And this is the cycle of the book of Judges. This is what we're going to see throughout the rest of the book. And the writer is going to unpack all of that in the subsequent chapters. So let's just look at this cycle more specifically. And he's letting us into the story. So let's just use this chapter and this picture of the cycle to try to understand what's going on in the whole book. First thing you see in this cycle, the first thing that happens, and it's going to happen over and over and over again as the cycle repeats itself in the lives of Israel, is that they are going to forget the Lord God and all that he's done with them. And in fact, it said another generation rose up who didn't know the Lord or the works that he had done for Israel. They forgot who God was and what he had done. Again, this wasn't a forgetfulness of actual facts, but it was a lack of treasuring the realities of who God was. He wasn't precious or central to them anymore. They had not learned to treasure and rejoice in what God had done. In some sense, you could say they had forgotten the gospel message to them that they were saved from slavery in Egypt by the miraculous and mighty acts of God's grace in their life. They had forgotten God. And as they forgot God, as God was no longer precious to them, well, the facts remained, but their hearts were growing harder and colder to those things. Bring on the bales. Bring on the foreign gods. So they didn't only forget God, now they're going to blend their worship and blend their faith. Because God and his salvation was no longer precious to them, what's another God? Look at verse 11. The Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Now they worship the Baals, and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods from the surrounding peoples and bowed down to them. That infuriated the Lord, for they abandoned him and worshiped Baal and the Asherahs. Now, here's the thing. For the Canaanites and the surrounding nations, they had tons of gods. They had a God for every aspect of life, for agriculture, for business, uh, for romance, for war, for arts. Uh, each one had a particular area of influence, but none of them demanded total lordship or total rule over the entirety of someone's life. And so everyone could just mix and match and, and pick different gods for different needs. Everyone had different gods depending upon what they needed, what they thought was most important to them. And they could discard gods quickly and easily when their needs changed. And when their desires changed. And so a Canaanite could worship Baal and add the worship of Yahweh and not think twice about it. It wouldn't mean anything to them. They simply didn't see the, exclusive, the exclusivity of worshiping Yahweh. Nor do they believe that Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, had lordship over the entirety of their life. But what about God's people? I mean, this, this isn't what God has revealed to them. This isn't how God has directed them. This isn't what God has said of their worship and their life. But here's the thing. In the new land, over time, as they allowed the Canaanites to remain, and they allowed the gods of the Canaanites to remain, over time, those gods must have become to seem more relevant to the life of God's people than Yahweh himself. Over time, 
the gods of the Canaanites, Baal, must have seemed more relevant to the everyday life of the Israelites than God himself. You see, Baal was considered to be the storm god. He was the god that brought rain. And so in a culture that lived on farming for the most part, that was a vital thing. So here the Israelites are no longer wandering in a wilderness anymore. Now they're in a land where they've got to grow stuff and their hearts have begun to not treasure the reality of who God is for them, what he's done for them, how he continues to provide for them and guide them. And here are the Canaanites worshiping Baal because this is the guy that brings the rain. Let's just add Baal. You'll see in the book of Judges as you read through the stories that ultimately the Israelites not only allow the worship of Baal to go on by the Canaanites, but ultimately they begin to allow the altars for Baal to be built next to the sanctuaries they built for Yahweh and ultimately in the sanctuaries for Yahweh. When you get this description in chapter three, it says the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and their daughters took to themselves for wives and their own daughters they gave to their sons and they served their gods. Small steps of accommodation in faith and in life got Israel to the place where they could worship God with their mouths but the reality of their life looked more like the lives of the Canaanites. And here's the thing. I was trying to think of the best way to approach this this morning. This is still the greatest danger for God's people. The blending of idolatry with the gospel in our hearts. You know, we don't have a hard time trusting God as God's people for heaven, for eternity. But when it comes to our jobs tomorrow, when it comes to our relationships tomorrow, when it comes to what we think will really matter and make us somebody, we have just as many bales as they did. It's not hard for us to find the idols of our own day and our own age seemingly more relevant to our everyday life than, than God and his gospel. This has always been the greatest danger for God's people. When we get to the place where we decide in our hearts that the idols of our age, the idols of our time, are more relevant to our life than God, who he is and what he's done, more precious to our life than God, who he is and what he's done, then we've been trapped. We've been snared, just as God said we would. And once those idols seem more precious to us and more relevant to us, we begin to give ourselves over to them, they've got us. They've bound us and they've enslaved us. Now we have to have those things. Now we don't feel like we're going to be anything if we don't have them. They've bound us and then we have to serve them. Not only do they bind us, but they're like thorns. They'll continually make us miserable. They can't forgive us when we fail them. And they rob us of joy. They rob us of everyday joy. And so here's the thing. You and I can still maintain our doctrinal commitments. And we can still maintain our intellectual understanding of the truth. But our passions, our desires, they can be shaped by something altogether different than the gospel. And this has always been the biggest danger for God's people. God wants control over every area of our lives, not just some. He told the Israelites to take the entire land of Canaan, but they only cleared out some areas, and then they learned to live in the midst of the idols and the gods of the people. So they neither rejected God, but they didn't wholly accept him and worship him either. This kind of halfway compromise, this kind of half blending is depicted throughout the entire book of Judges as an impossible and really unstable situation. And God wants all of our lives and, and not just part. 
We've got to keep going, though. Look at, look at the next part of the cycle. People slip into false worship, but then God's going to discipline his people. God's going to discipline them. Look at verse 14. The Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he handed them over to marauders who raided them. He sold them to enemies around them, and they could no longer resist their enemies. Whenever the Israelites went out, the Lord was against them and brought disaster on them, just as he had promised and sworn to them. So they suffered greatly. So various peoples or, or nations that the Israelites didn't drive out, they left remaining in the land, they rose up and invaded and plundered or enslaved the Israelites. And you see a whole host of them. Chapter three, you get the Arameans and the Moabites. And chapter four, the Canaanites. And chapter six, the Midianites. And chapter 10, the Ammonites. And chapter 13, the Philistines. All of this until the people, as we saw earlier in the verses, they no longer had the strength to resist their enemies. And so God uses the, what seems like evil intent of the nations around Israel of Israel's enemies for his own ends and for his own good, to bring his people, to bring the Israelites to repentance. And this is what you see happen. As they sin and God disciplines them, they eventually cry out to God for rescue in in a form of repentance. Look at this, verse 18. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for the Israelites, the Lord was with him and saved the people from the power of their enemies while the judge was still alive. The Lord was moved to pity, here it is, whenever they groaned, because of those who were oppressing and afflicting them. And as you read the stories of the judges and of this cycle throughout the rest of the book of their sin and of God's discipline and of God's deliverance, you'll see a phrase repeated in almost every single one of the stories. And that's that at some point in the story, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. In fact, a really clear version of it is in chapter 10, after they had been oppressed for 18 years. In chapter 10, verse 10, it says this. It says, the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, we have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals. And the Lord said to the people, did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the Ammonites and from the Philistines, from the Sidonians also and the Amalekites and the Minoanites when they oppressed you and you cried out to me and I saved you out of their hand? Yet you've forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you've chosen. Let them save you in your time of distress. Verse 15, the people of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. And so they put away the foreign gods from among them and they served the Lord. And he became impatient over the misery of Israel. And God raised up a deliverer who delivered them out of that oppression. But the cycle is clear. They sin, God disciplines. They repent, they cry out for mercy, for relief. God raises up a deliverer who will deliver them from their oppression. But that whole cycle of sin and discipline and repentance, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? I mean, here's the thing. People who, who want a religion that will do nothing but affirm you, that will tell you how good you are, you're going to find Christianity very disappointing. I mean, Christianity is about Repentance. Uh, Martin Luther in his 95 theses, the very first one, not the 32nd or the 27th, the very first one was this. He said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he intended that the entire life of believers should be repentance. See, every other religion on the earth, whether in the time of the Canaanites or today, every other religion on the earth will tell you of nothing but what you need to do to make yourself right with God. But Christianity alone declares that you have already utterly failed at every attempt you could ever make at doing that. Though you were made in the image and likeness of God, you have continuously rebelled against him. And your only hope, your, listen to this, your only hope lies in acknowledging your sin and crying out to God to forgive you for Jesus' sake. There has only been one person on this earth who has lived a life on this earth with no sin to repent of. Jesus is the only man who has ever lived a life on this earth with no sin to repent of. And he is the same one who took upon himself the punishment that you and I deserve for our sin. And the only proper response to God's saving and rescuing mercy is repentance. It's repentance. And so here, even in Judges, as the people repent, 
and they cry out to God for his continued deliverance and mercy. How does God deliver them? Well, verse 16 in chapter 2 says he raised up judges. Judges who would save his people from the power of the marauders. Now this entire book is, for the most part, structured around these judges. From chapters 3 to 16, you get all the stories of the various judges that God raised up to deliver Israel. But it's important to remember a few, thing about, few things about the judges. First, don't picture them with black robes sitting behind a big bench with a gavel. This isn't a judicial judge in the way we think about it. It's better to think of them like deliverers, like rescuers. And at the same time, they, you got to remember what was going on in the life of Israel when they came into the land and the land was split amongst the tribes. They were all scattered throughout the region now. There was no longer a central unit of people. They were all scattered. And so when you read the stories of the judges, what you'll see is that there was only a certain group of Israel or a certain region of the Israelites that was under oppression. And so God would raise up a deliverer that would save some of the people some of the time. And as we already read in chapter two, it would only last for a period of time. It wasn't like the entire nation of Israel was now being oppressed. Certain people were. And so God would raise up a judge or raise up a deliverer uh, to rescue them. And so the biggest thing to note about the judges, and it takes nothing but reading their stories to catch this. The biggest thing to note about the judges is that they were massively imperfect people. In fact, as the story goes on and the cycle repeats itself throughout the book, throughout those chapters about the judges, what you see is the judges actually seem to get a bit worse every single time. They get a little bit worse. There was a New Testament, or excuse me, an Old Testament commentary that took the five most popular judges that, that people are usually familiar with, and this is what it said about them. It said the five most popular judges were a reluctant farmer, a prophetess, a left-handed assassin, a bastard bandit, and a sex-addicted Nazarite, amongst others. These are the people that God raised up to deliver his people out of oppression. Massively flawed, massively sinful, But how did God's people respond to his grace and his deliverance? They didn't listen. They didn't listen to their judges. Verse 17 of chapter 2 says, They prostituted themselves with other gods bowing down to them, quickly turning from the way of their fathers who had walked in obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for the Israelites, the Lord was with him, and he saved his people from the power of their enemies while the judge was alive. The Lord was moved to pity whenever they groaned because of those who were oppressing them. But whenever the judge died the Israelites would act even more corruptly than their fathers, going after other gods to worship and bow down to them. They did not turn from their evil practices or their obstinate ways. So here's here's the point. Sinful people, sinful people like you and I, sinful people like the Israelites, they needed more than a human judge or a human deliverer. These judges, these deliverers, as great as they were at times, They could only at best deliver the body. They could never deal with the soul. They could never deal with the heart. As helpful as they were in delivering some of God's people some of the time for a period of time, they were never enough in themselves. And as you read the book and you see the cycle progress, the cycle looks less like a cycle and more like a downward spiral. The judges just get weaker and more sinful. The repentance of God's people just gets more shallow, ultimately till we get to the last five chapters of the book of Judges, which depicts some of the most deplorable, sinful actions in the lives of men and women. Forget the people of God in the lives of men and women. And in those last five chapters are the only five chapters you'll see in this entire story where there was no repentance that came from God's people. There was no repentance. This is just a continual downward spiral of sin. The book ends with God's people not trying to drive out the Canaanites, not trying to drive out the nations from the land, but ultimately in a civil war with one another. And then the book just kind of trails off. The story just kind of trails off. And it ends with that famous verse, in those days, Israel had no king. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And some say the book of Judges is a story about the people of God taking the land, but how the land ended up taking God's people. And as we read it, and you work your way through it, and we're meant to be emotionally and 
and really even morally tired by the time we finish the book. It's meant to wear us out. The increasing magnitude of evil and and sin and brokenness in the story points us to our need for a deliverer, our need for a savior. We don't need any more role models. We don't need any more role models. We need a savior. We need a deliverer. Like Israel, we needed someone who could save all of us, everyone. Israel just got deliverers who could save some of the people some of the time from some of their battles. What we need is the same thing that they ultimately need, and that's something far more powerful. And this is exactly what God has given us in the person of Jesus Christ. See, the book of Judges, is, it's a hard book. It's not a flattering book. But it is a book that makes abundantly clear that you and I are sinful, but that God in his grace is so wonderfully merciful. And what we need is God's mercy to us in the person of Jesus Christ. If you are not a Christian, I implore you to accept this mercy that God holds out to you by repenting of your sins and believing in Jesus. If you are a Christian, I love this, the the Bible in particular, the New Testament, it repeatedly calls God's people sheep. And the one thing about sheep is that they're prone to wander and they're prone to get distracted. If you are a Christian, ask yourself, have you begun to take God's grace for granted? I mean, be really honest with yourself. Do you find the idols and desires of our day seemingly more relevant to your everyday life than the gospel than God do you know a lot about him and what he's done but has he ceased being precious to you the good news is the response is the same it's to repent it's to repent this is what God has called all of us to do All of life is repentance. And God relentlessly, relentlessly offers his grace to people who do not deserve it, who do not seek it, and who do not appreciate it, even though we've been saved by it. Let me pray for us this morning. God, your word gives us um, such an accurate picture of our hearts. Uh, When we read it, we see that we are no different than Israel. We sin. We exchange the truth of you for lies. Uh, We dismiss your grace, take it for granted. We think other things will be better for us than who you are and what you've done than your grace and your mercy. God, I would just ask that by your spirit you expose to each of our hearts where we have traded your grace and your mercy for something else, where we've presumed upon your grace or where we have found other things, other idols even of our own day and of our own age seemingly more relevant and purposeful for our life. I pray that you would do what only you can do and you would bring us to a place of repentance, of recognizing our sin, not justifying it, but agreeing with you about it, confessing it, and repenting of it, trusting in your mercy and your grace. Uh, We ask this, Lord, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, who makes that possible. Amen.